Week three, everybody, in case you haven't been tracking with us or you're in the mood for a quick little review, here's where we're at. We're wondering what would it mean for St. Andrews to take hold of God's call in the coming months and in the coming years. And we looked at the scripture and we saw that there are a whole bunch of things that the gospel writers and the epistle writers have to say to us. And we thought that we can't do them all, but we can focus at least on three. On our first week together, we heard a little story about being lost in the woods. And we said a map is kind of like God's wisdom. It gives us an overview of where we are and where we want to get to, that there's a wisdom that comes from above that will guide us in the coming months, in the coming years at St. Andrews as we take hold of God's call. Last week we heard a little story of a bunch of teen boys who were humbled by the Lord as they served their younger children among them. It was up to them to care with the love of Christ and they stepped up and did so. And we decided that maybe God is shaping among us a similar heart of service to embrace things that may not be our first desire, but as the Lord puts these things in front of us, we do them for his power, or to the name of his power and his glory. And today, we're looking at faith. And I've got a little story that actually doesn't involve a pool, whatever this is. It involves a life jacket, but I couldn't get the life jacket to stay up on here. So I'm going to swing back to the pulpit and tell you a little story about a life jacket. I'll turn this off to the same. There are a few, let's call them pathologies, that exist within the Clements family. So parents and siblings and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and all the rest of it. One of them is that we just, all of us love to be out on the river when the waves are big and foamy and you feel like you're living life but you're, you're tasting death at the same moment. Aria, our daughter, she doesn't swim yet, so we, we don't subject her to either these things. We, we're, we're good and responsible parents, everybody. But one of the things just like a little goal that we have for Arya as she grows up, is it would be fun if she wanted to join us at some point in the canoes and the kayaks and the big frothy waters when she can swim and when she's comfortable, okay? So don't, don't call CAS or anything. <laughs> but, but here's the point, everybody. This summer we were camping east end of Algonquin, and I don't know if you've ever been, I don't know if you're campers, but there's a little campground called Acre, if I've pronounced it right. It's where Tom Thompson held a residency from about... 1912 to 16 or so, if I have that correct. And he painted there such paintings like the Jack Pine that hangs in the National Gallery in Ottawa. Out that way, about a day's paddle from, from Tom Thompson's cabin is a series of cascades carved into the Canadian shield that, that basically function like a, like a water slide. There, there's grooves in the shield that are, are large, and some of them are for adults, like you're going to get splashed and tumbled, and your feet will be up, and your head will be down, and it'll be a lot of fun. There are also some spots along here that are good for children who are about, say, three years old. Uh, Miss and I were thinking, this might be a fun introduction for Arya to, to you know, feel what current is like and, and grow accustomed safely, everybody, to to this thing that we hope that she grows into. Um, I remember uh, we, we, we selected a stretch of this little river. It's basically like a trickle, like a little creek, but, but it was a smooth bottom and, and the rock was carved out in such a way that you like go around the corner. There's about a foot drop at the bottom and you splash into kind of like a foamy pile that if dad is there, he can quickly grab Arya and, and off we go. So I went once to demonstrate what this was like and she watched, then, then we went twice, so I put her between my legs and down. It's like, like a four foot slide and a one foot drop, so it's nothing, nothing tremendous. And then we were like, Ari, do you wanna, do you wanna give this a shot on, on your own? And you know, there's, she's a smart girl, I'm gonna tell you that. There's some hesitation, but she gets up to the top and, and there's this moment where she realizes that she wants to do this, but it's gonna take something that she hasn't yet in her three years of existence done. She's gotta be, all in in this moment and if she's not all in she's not going and if she's not going then she's not going and that's the end of it of course um you know nissa and i prodded her a little bit and i don't know if she's what she's thinking in that moment maybe she's thinking i need new parents or something <laughs> like that but she takes the plunge has a blast drops in the bottom comes up smiling doesn't do it again, which is fine. We're, we're proud of her nonetheless. But there's a moment, actually there's several moments that are like that in the Christian life as well. There are moments in the Christian life where what God puts before us, either we are all in, either we've committed ourselves and we're playing the game, we're following the Lord, or we're standing on the sidelines watching others follow the Lord. 
And the challenge that the scriptures have before each of us this morning is why not be as we look to the future, as we look to Peter's arrival, as we look to the things that God may continue to do among us here at St. Andrews, why not be people that as we take hold of God's call say, yes, in fact, I want to be all in. The text that Shah read for us this morning is a picture of someone who is also themselves all in for Jesus Christ. It may be a text that you've heard many times in your Christian life. Uh, If you grew up through Sunday school, I have every confidence that you've heard this several times before. But here's the thing about God's spirit and about the scriptures, everyone. Even as we're familiar with the story that is before us, God's spirit still speaks and still nudges, still calls us to account, still lays out the Christian life before each one of us. Let's turn to God's word this morning and hear perhaps the Spirit speak and call us and not just and say, St. Andrews, will you be a church and will you be individuals who are all in for Jesus Christ? In the story, we see Peter, rather, we see Jesus, full day of ministry, has gone up on a mountainside to pray. And uh, you can imagine he is not sick of the disciples, but he's looking forward to a moment away, some peace and quiet from the busyness, from the hubbub of the day. He says, I'm going to go up on the mountain and pray, and why don't you guys just go somewhere far away? So he tells them, get in the boat, go across the sea, I'll catch you on the other side. They get in the boat, they're heading across the sea, and there's a storm that whips up when they're out there. They are rightfully terrified at that point. I don't know the construction of old boats, but they're not as sturdy as steel hauled boats today that we enjoy. There's a fear among the disciples, and as they look out into the storm, they see the dark, crashing waves. They see the spray. They feel the spray probably on their face. They hear the winds rippling, not rippling. What's a more strong word? Like tattering, banging the, uh, the sail on the mast. And they say, we are in a situation that we would really, really rather not be in. Someone looks out across the water and they see a ghostly apparition, they figure, because no one to this date has walked on water. But as this ghostly apparition draws closer to the boat, someone has the presence of mind to say, this is Jesus, it is the Lord. Peter, impetuous as always, stands up and calls out to Jesus, Lord, if it's really you, call me out upon the water. And I want to emphasize that Peter's choice here if I can say this, is on the edge of recklessness, okay? At that time, life jackets were not yet invented in the world. Peter, we have every reason to believe, is probably clothed. I don't know why he would be naked in the boat. That would be very unusual. But the clothing at the time was heavy, woolen. Um, It would have taken on a lot of water. If he is sinking without a life jacket in large, foamy, frothy waves in the night, with clothes that are water-laden. He's not long for this world, okay, everybody? In fact, this week I took a, I was doing a little bit of research for the sermon, which is always good, that's what you want, and I found out there are things called swimming historians in the world, and I I guess there's historians for everything. Swimming historians have, have, have looked at where did swimming come from, when was it first done by human beings, and the first record we have of people training and competing, like going to lessons and and honing their stroke craft is in fact in 1830s in England. Swimming has existed for thousands of years beforehand, but it tends to be something that you do for survival, and it's not something that you tend to do for athleticism, it's not something that people train to do. What we might see here in Peter in this decision that he makes is that he's all right at swimming, perhaps we don't know exactly, but he's not trained, he's not an Olympian, and as we've already pointed out, no life jacket, large waves, full of waterlogged clothes. If Jesus doesn't catch him, if this doesn't work out, he is five minutes, maybe not much longer for this world. Nevertheless, what happens here? Jesus says, come out to me. And Peter, in a moment of faith, in a moment of decision, says yes. He is all in in Jesus' call, and he steps out of the boat. Two remarkless remark. remark. Two things happen. I forget what word I was going for there. Two things happen. Number one, in verse 33, after Peter has walked on the water and they come back into the boat, the text describes for us that the the, the people who are in the boat say, truly, you are the Son of God. They say this to Jesus because they've seen something miraculous. They, like Peter, know the recklessness of his act, and they've seen that Jesus Christ is mighty to save, and he has performed a sign and a wonder among them. When we act in faith, 
St. Andrews and as individuals who follow Christ, when we act in faith, something wonderful and marvelous happens is that Jesus Christ's name is lifted up and given glory. A second thing occurs in this passage that I want to point out to us. In verse 31, Peter, in a moment, after his moment of decision, maybe to his credit or perhaps not, thinks better of what he is doing in that moment. Maybe he thinks about life jackets which are yet to be invented or something like that. But his eyes turn from Jesus to the waves and the storm that he finds himself in. And in that moment, he has like, like a clarity of thought where before he, he had like total trust and he, he, didn't, he didn't play it safe. But in this moment, he, he's thinking about, maybe I should have played this safe. He's second guessing himself. And as he second guesses himself, something interesting happens that we should notice here is that he begins to sink. And afterwards, Jesus pulls him up and Jesus says, why did you doubt? Did you not have the courage to trust me the whole way through? You know, St. Andrew says, we take hold of God's call here. As Peter comes and a new chapter of church life arrives upon us, there will be challenges whereby we are called to be all in for Jesus Christ, but not just a one-time all in for Jesus Christ. There will be a call upon each of us as individuals and as a church body as a whole to sustain that choice, to sustain that commitment, and to sustain that trust in who Jesus is. Why not as we look to the future here at St. Andrews, be people who act according to what we believe. We confess Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and to ever, yesterday, today, and forever, and he's worthy of all trust, all praise, and all glory. Why not conform our actions to express that marvelous truth, not just once, but as a sustained commitment to Jesus Christ as Lord. There's a sermon illustration that I've, I've heard a few times in my life. I don't know if you have, but, but if you have heard it before, this will help us in this moment to grasp some of what perhaps the Lord is setting in front of us. Let's imagine for a second there's a tightrope walker, and perhaps let's imagine for a second that they are down on the gorge. I don't know if you've gone for a Sunday afternoon hike uh, ever down through the gorge, but often in their summers, there are people, I don't know the name of the sport, I think it's called slacklining, who, who will string tight ropes across the gorge, and they, they tie themselves off so it's safe, and they bounce up and down in the middle of the gorge, high above the water, and it's quite impressive. Let's imagine one of these people uh, has walked back and forth on their tight rope, and the, and the crowd, including us, is like, yeah, that's great, we applaud, that's wonderful. And then, let's imagine for a second, one of these slackliners takes a wheelbarrow and, they, and they, go, they go to the far side of the gorge and back and the crowd including us says yeah that's wonderful that's very impressive way to go and then, then this person on, on the slack line maybe asks us who believes that someone can get in this barrel and I take them to the far side and back and of course we the crowd say yeah yeah that's very important that's impressive why don't you do it and then this person says and you know who will this be and, and us who, who judge well we've got a good head on, upon our shoulders None of us raise our hands. I, for the record, I wouldn't do it either. But, but this little illustration portrays to us something that is significant about the way that we use the language of belief and we use the language of faith in modern Western North America. Belief for us tends to mean a set of ideas that we've decided are true. It's something that like, occurs in our minds, we might say. You may say, I believe that McDonald's is the best fast food restaurant, or I believe that, you know, whatever it is that you believe. Faith in the way that we use it in our modern Western world tends to be an action that is taken upon a belief. So if I believe McDonald's is, I don't know if I do, but it's just an illustration for the moment. If I believe that McDonald's is the best, then I go there and I have faith that it won't clog my arteries and I'll suffer awful things. But here's the point, everyone. In fact, the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, time and time again, do not use the language of faith and belief like that. Belief in the New Testament is not just a set of ideas that we hold to be true in our mind, but it's a way of acting and existing within this world. The New Testament, faith tends to be a noun. It's a, it's a state in which we are before our Lord, before our Maker. And belief tends to be a verb. It's what we do because of who we are and who God has created us to be. And I want to point out just two instances among us here that will call us to be not only people who hold ideas to be true about who Jesus is. We confess him as Lord, but we want to put actions behind that. We want to live in such a way that others will know that we believe strongly that Jesus Christ is Lord to the praise and glory of God the Father. 
In John 14, Jesus knows at this point that he's going to the cross. He gathers his disciples around him and he says this to them. I'm just going to read one verse here. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. At this moment in the scriptures, Jesus is not calling the disciples just to think of ideas about who Jesus is, but he's calling them to a pattern of life that's characterized by trust in Jesus, that he really, really is Lord. This is the same call that the Lord extends to each one of us this morning. Believe also in me, says Jesus. May your lives be patterned by acts that portray your trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. A second passage that I want to bring to our attention this morning. Let me read it from my notes here, actually. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12. Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonia, and he says basically the same things that we've been hearing the Spirit and the Word speak to us this morning. Why not be a church that not only confesses what is true, but acts upon that confession as well? Paul says to the church, with this in mind, we pray constantly for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. May God, St. Andrews, bring to fruition every deed prompted by faith, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified. As we look to the future, what are the, some of the things that the Lord may be setting you in front of us as a church or perhaps as individuals? Where are some of the areas that perhaps the Lord is calling us to step out in faith, to get out of the boat, to be all in for Jesus? And in fact, St. Andrews, I'm really delighted to tell you this morning, I'm not entirely sure. And the reason I'm not entirely sure is that the Spirit who is calling and nudging and shaping and forming and giving birth to our Christian fellowship here at St. Andrews will put those things in front of each one of us. There's a passage in the scriptures where Jesus is explaining what it means to follow him to Nicodemus, and he explains what it is when a group of people who are born of the Spirit gather together. Jesus says to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Perhaps Peter has an idea in mind. I, you know, I wouldn't put it past him. He's a guy of wisdom, a guy of knowledge and understanding. He had, perhaps he has an idea and a sense of where the Lord is leading St. Andrews. Perhaps our elders do. I wouldn't put it past them either. There are people that, I, this is not to flatter them, but they are people that hold God's wisdom, that seek his wisdom earnestly and truly. Perhaps they also have an idea of where the Lord is leading us. But perhaps... When the time is right, at God's perfect Kairos moment, as his wind blows, the wind of his spirit blows through our congregation, we will know the times and the places where God calls us to be all in for him, to his praise and his glory. Nevertheless, so let me leave you with three notions, three senses of where God may, even today, even this week, maybe even in the coming month, may be calling us to step out of the boat to be all in for Jesus. Number one, I have found in my life, not every day, uh, often not every week, but kind of month to month, the Lord makes a space for me just to tell a little bit about who I've experienced Jesus to be. It's an opportunity, it, it just kind of, the situation, the conversation that I'm in opens up, and there's a space there for me to give an account of who I've discovered Jesus to be. Um, I don't know if I should say this, to my shame sometimes I just pass that over. But to God's credit, we'll say sometimes I have the presence of mind to step out in faith. It's an awkward experience because I don't know how it's going to be received. Sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, who is this guy? But sometimes people engage and respond and say, I would like to know this Lord a little bit more. I have just every confidence that the people of God are people that have a story of God's goodness and that God himself makes the opportunity for these stories to be shared. One way where you and me actually can act in faith in maybe the coming days, weeks, and months is be prepared as God makes the opportunity open to us to give an account of who you've experienced him to be. It's personal and it's awkward. I have every account or confidence that's true, but it's to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ. Second, why not cultivate an attitude among us that is generous? 
be generous with what God has given you, your time. I know we're not really supposed to talk about money from the pulpit, but be generous if you are able with what God has given you. Be generous with your care. Be generous with your, con with your conversation. It is easy in the Christian life to be concerned with the things that concern us, but why not in an act of faith say, God, help me to be concerned with the things that concern you. I speak in general terms here because I don't keep personal notes on all of your lives. I've got no idea where the Lord is shaping you, where the Lord is placing you, but consider being a person who is generous in faith. And finally, whether you're 8 or 80, it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter how mature you are in the Christian life. Perhaps you became a Christian yesterday, perhaps you've been following the Lord for 80 years in your Christian journey. But why not be people of prayer who pray as if Jesus really hears, and Jesus really cares, and Jesus really, really responds. Sometimes in our Christian life, uh, just sometimes, St. Andrew, you, we, I, sometimes I hear little stories of, yeah, let's pray, but but the Lord will, you know, the Lord sometimes doesn't answer prayer. Don't, don't let that, that, that sentiment dig into your hearts. Don't let that sentiment shape your prayer lives. Why not, as we hear a message on being all in for Jesus, whether you're 8 or you're 80, be people who pray as if Jesus hears and cares and responds. Where have we gone these past three weeks, everybody? We've heard that the Lord is calling us to be people of wisdom, who understand with the knowledge that comes from above. As we look to the future, Jesus may be calling us to people, to be people who are humble, who are ready to serve even in the situations that we find ourselves because his name is great and he has set us there. And this morning we hear from the scriptures, why not be a people whose actions are characterized by the faith that we confess? Why not be a people who are all in for Jesus Christ? Amen.